and eight special presentations. In this edition of Artbeat Nation, the record executive with the Midas Touch. I wanted David Geffen to be as involved in as many aspects of my career as possible. A real life guitar hero who makes each instrument a piece of art. It's taken me a long time to be completely comfortable with the notion that I make really nice acoustic guitars. A filmmaker whose movies give a glimpse of the past. What do I see in life that's interesting to talk about that I don't see on the big screen? And a painter with divine inspiration. Every piece of art I do, I can't explain how I did it. It was meant to be. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. Funding for Art Beat Nation is made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you. You've heard of the Eagles, Bob Dylan, and Cher, but do you know the man behind their music? David Geffen is an influential record executive, film producer, theatrical producer, and philanthropist. And even at the start of his career, many musicians saw Geffen's determination and jumped at the chance to work with him. At the time, most of us, we would do anything to be with David Geffen. We didn't even ask any questions. Here, sign this, it's going to be fine. Here, I'm going to get you a publishing deal. Sign this. Here, you're going to record for me. You know, you're going to be my manager. I didn't care. I wanted David Geffen to be as involved in as many aspects of my career as possible. Glenn Frey and John David South were a duo. And David listened to them, and he said, well, J.D.'s could make a solo album. And he looked at Glenn and said, but, you know, you should be in a band. You really need to be in a band, you know. Go get a band. So Glenn went out and put together the Eagles. I like the way you spark Against your skin, so but the other labels, there was no gestation period, there was no curing period, there was no period in which people really had a chance to develop, you know, their singular voice. And uh, I think David was, you know, had his ear to the ground in that way. He was paying attention to what the artists themselves were feeling. So I gotta be David said, just worry about the music. I'll take care of everything else. Yeah, he put me on a small salary so I could pay my rent and get a car. He turned me on to a dentist to get a couple of bad teeth fixed. He supported them for a long time while they practiced and became the Eagles and kept them together while they really learned to sing the way they sang. David did say to me, he says, you know, don't worry, Glenn, you're going to be rich. I'm going to be richer but you're going to be rich. And that's exactly what happened. I remember when I decided to put out the greatest hits after four albums, everybody was shocked, you know, they said, you don't put out the greatest hits until they're on the way down. And I thought, no, put it out now. And uh, it's the biggest selling album of all time. The label, in a very, very short period of time, became very, very hot. And everybody talked about them. I mean, uh, if there's such a thing as a zeitgeist of that time, that was Asylum Records. Asylum was the voice of the 70s. In 1973, the percentage of records that we released that were successful was higher than any record company in the world. One of the interesting things about Asylum, I think, David, is that it, it perhaps more than almost any label I can think of, reflects the musical taste of the person who runs it. You, you do have very specific musical ideas, don't you? Uh, I think I like music, you know, whatever strikes me as being good is something that I want to record. I mean, mm. I, I don't think that every record that we make is a hit or that every artist that we record is going to be a star, but I think that all the music that we put out is very valid and that uh, all the people making these records are making good records. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's important. And they get a free opportunity to make these records. And if we believe in them, we'll stick with them, whether they make it or not. And mm -hmm. we're not going to drop an artist if they don't sell. That isn't the kind of company it is. Right. David wanted commercial success. He was a business. He wanted to sell a lot of records. 
but he was balancing the roster with not just those people he thought could break through to gold and platinum status, but just also people who deserve to have their music heard and marketed. If you're an artist, you know, to have somebody who's in your corner and willing to really go fight for you, David was that guy. I've heard him say, you know, that I'd rather die than fail. He has this tremendous will to win. And from one music maker to another. Next, meet Charlie Hoffman, an artisan who has been handcrafting acoustic guitars since 1970. Watch as he takes us through the artistic creation of a Hoffman original guitar. first guitar was finished in June of 1970. I played it, I thought it sounded good, but I needed feedback and one of my very good friends who was a good guitar player and a musician immediately asked me to make one for him. It's taken me a long time to be completely comfortable with the notion that I make really nice acoustic guitars. When talking about what makes a guitar sound good, the simple answer is everything. The issue that we're constantly dealing with, with guitar tops specifically, is that they are being subjected to 175, 200 pounds of pressure 24 seven from the strings being on them. And left to its own device, this piece of wood, which is about 110 thousandths of an inch thick, would blow up very soon. So what we have to do is apply braces inside. This is called an X brace. It's actually two pieces of wood that are notched and glued together. Hide glue is essentially gelatin. It is the oldest form of glue that we know of. There is at least some reason to think that hide glue makes guitars that sound better. The point of heating up the wood is so that the glue will not get cold. The size, the placement, the design of the braces to the top has more to do with the sound of the guitar than anything else, just flat out. And so the process of carving braces makes or breaks the guitar. For me, what I'm doing is partly the woodworking thing. It's partly that I love guitars. I think that they are artful, they are beautiful, they are fun to hold. I love the sound of them. But there's another part of it, and this may sound a little grandiose, but I really believe that music is important in this world. I'm not a musician, but I can contribute by making guitars for other people to make music. It's a very delicate quality, but my specialty is a kind of a naked sound. I don't have a lot of effects. I'm just playing with just the acoustic instrument. I mean, every different guitar has got a personality, and the kind of uh, vocabulary you'll play on it will spring from that kind of personality on the guitar. Now, one, the great thing about this guitar is it plays very, very well uh, everywhere. The guitars that I choose to make are ones that follow the tone that's in my head. I like guitars that tend to be very clean, not muddy, crisp, uh, have a lot of projection, power, dynamic range. That's what I like to hear. 
of all the things that people ask me about building guitars, how do you bend the wood is the most common. This is Indian rosewood. I soaked it in a tray of water for a couple hours. I'm going to be clamping it to this form here, which is heated. Uh, it's currently about four or 500 degrees. The water and the heat are what make the bending work. The hard part is the starting and getting everything lined up. And then the actual bending around the jig is pretty straightforward and pretty easy. Done. There are people in this world who buy expensive guitars and hang them on the wall and look at them. And to me, that's not just the glass is half empty as, as opposed to half full. It's the glass is empty. They're supposed to make music. So I love the look of them, I love the feel of them, but if the other part of it, the making music, is not there, then somehow that guitar is being cheated. This particular piece, the bending went very well. It's, the curves are smooth with, with no kinks or anything like that. A very large part of the enjoyment of what I'm doing is with any guitar of any model, whether I'm making it for an individual or just on spec for hanging on the wall, is at some point I string it up for the first time and I get to hear it and I enjoy that. And they're all different, maybe not radically different, but they're all different and it gives me pleasure to hear that. Tim is playing, my response to it is partly, oh my God, he's playing my guitar. How cool is that? But an awful lot of my guitars are in the hands of people who just play them and enjoy them. To date, I have made 602 guitars, and seeing somebody come in and pick up their new guitar and play it, and there's a light in their eyes, is very gratifying. Charlie Hoffman has built more than 600 guitars in his Minnesota shop. To find out more, visit HoffmanGuitars.com. Next, meet filmmaker and award-winning fiction writer John Sales. Through his career, Sales has continued to pursue both of his passions. Raphael P. Roman sits down with Sales to talk about his most recent film, his latest novel, and his fascinating career. What is your name? Mi nombre. Amigo. Soy muy amigo. Now, John, your most recent film, Amigo, uh, deals with the Philippine-American War. Why did you decide to make a movie about a war that most people haven't even heard of? When I was doing research for my novel Los Cusanos, I went back to the Spanish-American War. And in that research, I kept running into this phrase, the Philippine Insurrection or the Philippine-American War. And I'd never heard of it. I started asking some of my Filipino and Filipino-American friends, what do you know about this? And they said, well, you know, it wasn't taught in our schools either. Um, and that got me suspicious. Damn, damn, damn the Filipinos, cross-eyed khaki at the drones. Underneath the starry flag, civilize them with the crag, then return us to our own beloved homes. How do you... And why do you make a war disappear where maybe a million people got killed? But why do, don't we know about it? I mean, we won the war, and the wars that we win, we usually brag about. Yeah, I think it was a combination of a little bit of shame. At the time that it was happening, the justification for it was almost all racial. Rudger Kipling's poem, Pick Up the White Man's Burden, the subtitle of the poem is The U.S. and the Philippines. It's his open letter to the United States saying, you're white Christians, they're little dark people. It is not just your opportunity, it is your white Christian duty 
in the Philippines it was we didn't want them to know their own history. We did not want them to remember um, that they had a Philippine Republic with very educated people as the elected officers with a constitution that was partly based on our constitution, that they weren't a bunch of people, you know, in a hut somewhere, you know, making things up over a cook fire. And now your new book, A Moment in the Sun, also partly deals with the Philippine-American mm -hmm. War. What is the relationship between the book and the film? Well, they kind of evolved from each other. Uh, I wrote a screenplay 12 years ago or so called uh, Some Time in the Sun that dealt very specifically with the 25th Infantry, which was uh, all black infantry, white officers, black soldiers, who fought both in the Cuban campaign in the Santiago and then were later in the Philippines, and the fact that while some of them were away, their right to vote was being taken away in the southern states. The last kind of nail in the coffin of Reconstruction was in North Carolina, in Wilmington, where in 1898 there was this racial coup. And I realized, okay, here's the connection, and the connection is race. The novel, A Moment in the Sun, I mean, includes so many topics. Mm -hmm. The Spanish-American War, the Philippine-American mm -hmm. War, that racist coup in Wilmington, mm -hmm. the gold rush in the Yukon, mm -hmm. the birth of the movies, the, the power of the yellow press. Mm -hmm. This novel, which comes into about a, a thousand pages, yeah, right? 960. <laughs> it, it's truly an epic. How long did it take you to research it and to write it? You know, because I had started it as a screenplay and then it, I kind of realized we'll never get the money to make this thing, I put it aside for a while. I always felt like I was cramming too much into a two-hour movie. What if I made it into a novel? And I'd written novels before. I could expand it a little. And then, as happened with Los Cusanos, my previous novel, there was a strike of the Writers Guild of America, <laughs> and I had seven or eight months where I was unemployed and really couldn't be working on anybody else's stuff. So I just had time to sit down. So I did most of the actual writing of it in about a year. A Moment in the Sun is your first novel in 20 mm -hmm. years, right? About 20 Something years. Like that, yeah. But you started out as a fiction yeah. writer. What was the transition from being a novelist and a short story writer to writing for films yeah. and directing films. Yeah, it's interesting because certainly as a kid I saw, I read books, but I saw more TV and, and, and movies than I read books. But when I started, it was obvious I don't have any money. I didn't go to film school. I don't know anybody in the movie business. So I started with a thing that I could do, which was to write stories. Always in my head, would, wouldn't be cool to be able to make a movie. And my literary agent, his agency had a deal with a Hollywood agency. So I came out to L.A. and the first job I got was a rewrite on this Jaws ripoff thing. And the movie did very well. And then I, I wrote a couple other movies. And all of a sudden I had $40,000 in one place at one time, which I'd never had before. Me to me. And I wrote Return of the Sakaka 7 very much with what can I do well for $40,000. And I wrote it for a bunch of people who were about to turn 30 because all the good actors I knew were about 30 and they weren't in the Screen Actors Guild yet. So it was very much a, here's what I've got to make the movie, what can I make well for that much money. But Baby It's You came out in 1983, that was a studio movie, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we shot it for what was even then a very low budget movie for a studio which was three million dollars, almost all in, in New Jersey. What's your name? Jill. What? Jill. Pleasure to meet you, Jill. They call me the Sheik. The Sheik? Yeah. Are you an Arab? No, I'm Italian. So the making of it was wonderful. The editing was fun up until the point where the studio said, um, this doesn't look like Porky's, this doesn't look like a teen comedy. And he said, well, it was never meant to be a teen comedy. So what happened then? They we started to... fighting over the cut. At some point, I was kicked out of the editing room. They did their cut. It didn't test any better. In fact, one point worse than my cut. So they let me finish the movie. I was happy with what the movie looked like, but they didn't kill themselves distributing the movie. But you never did another studio... Uh, no, I, I did um, Eight Men Out was done with Orion. It was one of the last movies Orion did. Say it ain't so, Joe. Say it ain't so. And they pretty much said, okay, uh, if this is two hours and under, you can make this movie. And the movie's an hour and 59 minutes and 37 seconds or something like that. And everybody talks really fast. <laughs>
So most of your films are self-financed or, or with uh, some Or independent money when friends. that was around. Oh. So for about a five-year period, we were able to finance things by selling it to a home video company first. They would put up two to three million dollars to make the movie. And then together, well, then we'd go look for a theatrical distributor. But that was back when there were maybe 25 to 30 independent movies made every year. Sundance Film Festival will probably get this year over 2,000 feature films submitted. So would you say that a Sea Cocker 7 couldn't happen? Yeah, we probably wouldn't even get into Sundance. Este es mi legado. Cada hombre debe dejar un legado. You know, in your film, Men with Guns, um, the protagonist, Dr. Fuentes, is so concerned about his legacy that he's willing to risk his life to make sure he leaves one behind. Mm -hmm. Are you in any way as concerned about your own legacy? No, I don't think so. There's already filmmakers that I think were world-class filmmakers who are almost forgotten, you know, and they've only been dead for 20 years. I think it's pretty rare and, and pretty much random that anything lasts more than a couple generations. So really what I think more about rather than a legacy is mostly about the cultural conversation of the moment. What do I see in life that's interesting to talk about that I don't see on the big screen? One of the reasons I wrote A Moment in the Sun and got into the Philippine-American War is I'd never seen anything about it. I didn't even know it existed. This should be part of the conversation. And we should remember, you know, our history because um, the official version is not a very good version. Well, John, it's been a pleasure. Yep, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. John Sales has written or directed 28 films and has published 12 books. To find out more, visit johnsalesblog.com. Finally, meet Islamic artist Uza Mirza, who paints Arabic words as musical notes. Take a look at how Mirza combines music and faith. God, the creator, my architect, he speaks to me through my hand when I draw and I paint. Every piece of art I do, I can't explain how I did it. It was meant to be. Call Fort Wayne's Uzma Mirza, an architect by trade, a poet, a musician, a philanthropist, a painter with shows around the country. But if you ask me, she's a seeker. I was born and I woke up in this world, forgot where I came from. The whole journey is about remembering, which is called vicar, or reminder, who I am. And that's the quest. It's, it's, it's this word that's often misused in the Islamic world called jihad. Really, the jihad really means is a war with the self. It's to know the self. So my art is about knowing the self. Uzma was born in Nova Scotia and worked in the States and wants her followers to cast all preconceptions aside. For in spite of its ancient roots, her art is uniquely homegrown. Part of Uzma's Islamic art takes the Arabic names from the Quran and arranges them as musical scores. Like Al-Ghafur, which is the forgiving, or An-Nur, the light. And each of these are, are, are na actual names with the Arabic letters. These are notes, they're flowing, they're flowing, and we can reflect them, and they're like the notes of God. I go further and say it is finding the heart of the Tin Man. And the sustainable human is a Tin Man. The art is finding that heart as a Muslim woman. I have found it, I just need to clean it. I'm polishing it every day, daily, till I die. Some of the money Uza Mirza makes from her paintings goes toward her foundation to promote sustainability. For more information and to see more of her paintings, visit penandinkpot.org. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find featured videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you.